Wow, I guess I never realized how many ways there were to create state machines inside of Rust. Maybe I should try and build my own state machines. Just a couple. So here's the first state machine I created. It's just a door, it can be unlocked, it can be locked. And here's a small script just to allow you to enter a code and unlock the door and then immediately slam it back down. So as a quick demonstration, let's just cargo run this and enter the code, which is two and a six and a nine. And then boom, it immediately slams shut the door. Pretty easy state machine using Rust's built-in typing system to restrict the methods that can be called. Next up, we have a bottle which can be empty in the state of being filled or just be fully filled. Here we have all of our methods. It's using Rust enums. And let's open it up, cargo run. And it just tells us all the commands you can do. Let's open the bottle, fill it up with five units. That's 50% full and then the other five and then we can close it and now we have a completely filled bottle then we can just dump the rest out if we open it so yeah those are the two state machines on to the next one okay i think now i've officially outdone myself with this calculator i've spent approximately a couple of days doing this and well what can i say it became incredibly bloated there's so many features in this calculator, I am beginning to consider whether I should factually call it a calculator or if it's just a programming language because I am halfway there at, that, at this point. Let me just give you a quick demonstration to show you what I mean. I cargo run this project, you know, you can do the regular calculator stuff, do some 10 plus 10, simple right, 20, I think that's the answer at least, then you can add we have actions, so you can have a state with an action and then go more in depth. Maybe you want to say this. Now it's adding the 90 times the 1. I was meant to write 10 there. Then going past that, we can add variables. So if I say pi is equal to 3.19, you can see pi is one of the variables inside of my scope. Now if I were to say 4 multiplied by pi and well we get the answer 51.04 so yeah variables because every calculator has variables and we can go so much further trying to do this took years off of my life but now let me go on to explain the rest of this project and how it functions in depth that won't take that much time right Well, at this point, I might as well just add functions and a few built-in functions like sine and cos and tan and all of that. You know, just a couple of things to make it a full-blown calculator. Wait a minute, isn't this just becoming a programming language? Oh, well, now that you mention it, it is kind of becoming an interpreted language. But of course, it's still missing quite a few features of a modern programming language. I mean, it can't even run a file. Well, why don't you just make it into a programming language? Why don't I just make it into a programming language? Why don't I just make it into a programming language? Why don't I? Uh, my brain feels like it's about to explode. Every line of code I write, every syntax rule I define feels like a monumental task. What's the point of it all? Interpreted languages like mine are meant to be simple, easy. But no, 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 not mine, not mine, never mine. Mine has to be the worst language imaginable. All I ask for a bit of help, help, help me please. So this is Calibalang. And this video is about how I went from an empty RAS project to a barely functioning feature incomplete programming language. Starting from the name, what does the word caliber make you think of? Maybe thoughts of power, strength, metal, bullets, or if you're a madman like me, rust. This speaks to a core tenant of Caliberland. Rust or Zig probably did it best, 
and that tenant has yet to fail me. Deviating from that tenant, however, is another part of the story. All languages from Rust to Zik to C Sharp have a few common components that unite them. A lexer, a parser, and an abstract syntax tree, or an AST. How these languages differ, however, is in what happens after these components. A language like Python would compile the AST into bytecode, which is then run by an interpreter on a virtual machine built in a low-level compiled language. Other languages might take the AST and go through a process of walking it. During this process, each command is executed and outputs are stored as it traverses each AST node. This method, however, cleverly removes the need for dealing with garbage collection or other memory handling management, as it simply borrows that functionality from the host language it was coded in. A language like Rust, on the other hand, transforms the AST into an intermediate representation, or IR. The most common IR today is LLVM IR. Yes, this is what LLVM is, a compiling backend. The more you learn, right? From that intermediate representation, the language is then efficiently compiled into a binary. Some languages might go through the extra mile of creating their own dedicated compiler backend to avoid converting code into a pre-existing IR. However, this is less common nowadays as LLVM and GNU GCC are incredibly well supported and stable. Furthermore, converting code into an IR used by many other languages allows for better communication between them. And the last type of language I wanted to discuss today is transpilation, where your language's code is converted into another language and then run in that converted form. This is most commonly done by hobbyist projects, however it has seen some major success with TypeScript and V. So, after evaluating all of my options, I decided that the best option would be to do all five in a mini-series that will most likely take up most of my life. I am joking, obviously, unless that is something you would like to see in the future. However, for today's episode, I want to do interpretation. In particular, walking the abstract syntax tree interpretation. Okay, I think this is the part of the video where I talk about the actual programming language, not the process of making it. So here are just the interesting design choices I took as I created this language, starting from the top of this file, which is talking about how every function in my program language is a lambda function or closures they're sometimes called so that means they're just treated as variables and because functions are treated as variables we can do some shadowing if i were to copy this pmi function the second one would be shadowing the first one which is really 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 cool and it's just a little something i took from rust and of course, this entire file runs perfectly fine. 19.2 whatever and the 120, those are the correct answers. If you want, you can do the math. Then starting from the top of this new file, we can see importing, which works kind of similarly to how Rust does it, except everything is a bit more relative. But otherwise, we can import files within this hobbyist program language. Furthermore, if you look down here, we can see that we're using data coming from this data file here, which is just the language enum here. And what's interesting about this enum is how it's defined. All types in my language use this type syntax. So type, the name of the type is equal to whatever type it's actually equal to. This could be other data types. Like I could say type country base is equal to just an integer or float or struct or an enum or kind of any type available in my program language and any variation of any of those types. Going back to the main function here, we can see how enums can hold data, which is another really cool thing I took from Rust. I am taking quite a lot from Rust right now, but in my opinion, this is just such a valuable feature to have in your program language and just opens up so many different possibilities. Furthermore, we can look at these match functions. So the match function inside of my program language is just that, a function. 
To be exact, it works the exact same way as functions do in my program language, as in it is just a lambda, which I am calling using a pipe. Is this functional programming? Well, I don't know, not really. I just took a few really valuable things from functional programming, such as pipes, which just allow you to use this really nice syntax to be able to call other functions. And on the whole piping stuff, we can talk about currying. So the whole idea behind currying is just creating new functions based off of old functions and you kind of supplying some of the arguments of those old functions. I am doing a horrible job explaining it, but we can see that this all works perfectly fine. I am calling currying with 18, it is creating a new function that only takes in two different parameters, which I am then filling with the 20 and 15 in this example. And the same thing works with the regular call syntax, because my language supports both syntaxes for calling functions. Back up at the top of this file, we can see that my language has support for if let statements and even a bit further than how Rust does it by allowing you to have recursive ifs after the if let portion of the statement. My language also does the very interesting choice of every time there's a block, anytime you can have a block of, for a function, for a match statement, for ifs, for fors, you can just use this syntax the fat arrow going into whatever you want it to go into. So this completely varied in my programming language. Or in the other situation, you can put the curly brackets and it creates a whole new scope to just allow for multi-line statements. So yeah, this would work in my programming language as well as just this. Those are both completely valid ways of doing a for statement. Furthermore, on for statements, we kind of just put all of the iteration and all of the different types of ways of doing loops into one keyword. So of course you can do a for each loop. You can do a regular for loop iterating over a range or you can do a while loop or just using the for keyword which I think is just fantastic and is stolen from Go. Furthermore, my language has support for both um, optional and result enums which of course is fantastic and it's just another really great thing that Rust does, which my language is currently also stealing a bit of. So here on this match statement, I am pattern matching with OK and error, which is really cool. And we can also see that my program language allows for pattern matching of ranges and lists. So if this 18 here is a part of this range, then it will just go and do the print within range. Or if it is a part of this list, then it will that print that is a part of the list, which is really, really cool and just opens up different options when it comes to pattern matching. Another really cool way that my language achieves pattern matching is with the prefix and suffix pattern matching functions. This is kind of just me trying to emulate Gleam whilst not having as clean a syntax as Gleam. But it still works and it still does perfectly fine. So basically, you can just pattern match using the beginning or the end of a string. So I guess on to the next feature, which is just a couple of things I stole from Python. Is, is operator, really nice for checking types. Even added some special identifiers like number, decimal, integer, just to further define within the built-in types within my program language. Then of course, we have special variables the same way Python does them, with like underscore underscore name to differentiate whether the file that you're currently running is the root file for what you're currently running. Then furthermore, you, there's the int statement, which can just be used to check whether a number is within a list or a range, which is the last thing in this file. So let's look at some other different examples after running it, of course. Boom, everything comes out as you expect. Of course, the code is available on my GitHub if you really want to go and just check everything out one last time. So here we just have a short example of matrix multiplication within my program language. Yeah, the code isn't exactly my creation, but it is just a quick script showing how matrix multiplication would work in my program language. And it's just a great place for me to showcase 
that we do have list comprehensions, just like Python, and not the stolen Python feature. We also have support for left shift, right shift, and all of the other bitwise operations. So basically, every binary operation you'd want to do in your program language or in your script is available within Calibrelang. And I think that's basically everything within my program language. And of course, you can go find this entire project on my GitHub and check that out. But besides that, I think that's everything for today's video. In the next one, I'll probably be talking about the Rust GUI wars. I think I finally need to actually upload this video. Or I might be doing some stuff on Calibrelang. Maybe showcasing some apps I made using it. Or just explaining it more in depth or building another interpreter for Calibre Land. There's quite a lot I can do. But I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.